I'm Jeff. I'm Olivia, and this is Toby. And this is Lizzie. The scripture reading for this week is John 1, 1 through 5 and 14. In the beginning, the Word already existed. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. He existed in the beginning with God. God created everything through Him, and nothing was created except through Him. The Word gave life to everything that was created, and His life brought light to everyone. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness can never extinguish it. So the Word became human and made His home among us. He was full of unfailing love and faithfulness, and we have seen His glory, the glory of the Father's one and only Son. Merry, Merry Christmas. Christmas. Emmanuel! So today begins our four-part series through each Sunday of the Advent season, culminating in the celebration of the birth of Jesus Christ, which we choose to acknowledge on the 25th of December for a whole lot of reasons, none of which are uh, from Scripture, but they are certainly traditional, and there's nothing wrong with tradition. Um, but, in fact, nowhere... In the word of God, are we actually commanded to celebrate Jesus' birthday? Though it is my firm belief that it occurred during one of the feasts and there was a celebration going on, I happen to think it's the Feast of Tabernacles, and I have good reasons for, for thinking that if you're curious, but they don't matter to us this morning. I'm not going to go in, in, into it right now, or we'll be here till this evening. Nonetheless, our Christmas series this year revolves around one of the names of Jesus Christ. Emmanuel, which translates God with us. By the way, there are two very acceptable ways to spell the word Emmanuel, with an I or with an E. Ancient Hebrew did not have vowels, and so whichever one you spell it with is just fine. And I'm going to claim that this was intentional. It wasn't. But I'm going to say that it was intentional that Mitchell on the graphics is spelled with an I, and throughout my notes I spell it with an E, simply uh, because I want to make sure that I drove home the point that uh, there are two acceptable ways to spell it. All right. In our four-part series, Pastor Chad and I will be looking to answer the question, how was God with us in Christ? And we'll be looking at this in, in four parts, that he was with us in the flesh, that is a celebration of Christmas with Christ coming in the flesh to live a life as a human being. We are also going to celebrate that he is with us. And we are just going to celebrate that we are with each other in him. That there ain't no unity like the church unity. Even when we fight and squabble and spat because we're humans and we're fallen creatures, we still have a unity that exceeds what the, what the world even has access to. And fourth and finally, we'll be looking at that we will be with him forever in heaven. These are the four parts of our Christmas study. <clears throat> now, it is typically the first of these that occupies our December celebrations, that Jesus Christ came to earth to be with his people. He came as a baby. He was visited by shepherds and wise men, and somewhere a little drummer boy got thrown into the mix. I don't know where that came from. hate that song, though. I do, and I was a little drummer. I used to play the drums, and, and I still never liked that song, but that is personal, uh, my, my private thoughts. I don't care about that. It's all a very nice little scene full of snow and cozy little cabins, right? At least that's how we show it on our mantles and on our shelves. But this cannot be the whole story, nor should it be the sole focus of our Christmas celebration because the little baby didn't stay a little baby. And the birth of our Savior really means that we can be reborn ourselves. And in being reborn, we can be united in this life and assured of our perfect peace and unity in the next life. That is Christmas because that is why Jesus came. And as I said, this morning begins our Christmas season here at Creekside. This morning also begins our month at least as far as this is the first Sunday of December. And with that, typically, comes communion. And, and, and as I wrestled with how to handle this morning's message, I was once again struck by the fact that the incarnation, Jesus becoming fully human without losing his godness, 
is of little value without his atonement where he took our place in the cross. In other words, the cradle and the cross are equally important and without one, the other loses all importance. If Jesus was born, a bitty, itty bitty baby, in a, in a manger in Bethlehem, but he did not end up on the cross, then he's just a little freak of nature, a blurp a footnote to history and forgotten. If, however, Jesus Christ just showed up fully adult, appearing but not actually human, and he went to the cross, well, that's great. You died for something, but it sure wasn't humanity. Without the incarnation, the atonement loses power. Without the atonement, the incarnation is of no importance. Put it differently yet again, it is necessary to say that the atonement of Christ is the reason for the incarnation. It is the explanation of his twofold nature, God and man, and the focal point of world and biblical history. Everything led up to the birth, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, and everything has unfolded from it. And we are rightfully celebrating the birth of Christ this season. And this morning, as we're looking specifically at the life of Jesus Christ, it is so wrapped up in his death and resurrection that to separate them would do a horrible disservice. And so while I will seek to answer the question, how was God with us in Christ? I will be leading the entire time towards the communion table. Because there we do not find his actual presence, but certainly his symbolic presence And therefore, we are reminded of his continued presence with us even here today. Let's get started with a word of prayer. Lord Jesus, we celebrate your birth. For in doing so, we celebrate that you, God eternal, became man, and man, you eternally remain. Help us to celebrate well. For your incarnation led us, or led to your death, which leads us to life. Be with us as we explore your word, your self-revelation this morning. Speak clearly through me, though I deserve no such honor. Accomplish your will in this place and in our lives. We ask this in your name. Amen. And so we set about answering the question, how was God with us in Christ? Well, he was with us in our world. We start this morning with one of those 25 cent words, but like a lot of things, this one may have gotten cheaper with use. What I mean is that while this is a big word, it's pretty common, and many of us already know it, but nevertheless, it's an incredibly important topic and a word every Christian ought to know and understand. And we, of course, learn this word from watching old westerns and Bugs Bunny cartoons, right? Because a frustrated cowpoke would always say, What incarnation? Tarnation, my bad. I have no explanation for that word at all. You're going to have to ask Yosemite Sam or Ken Curtis or Buddy Ebsen. And if you're under the age of 40, you're going to have to ask my dad who these people are. Fair enough? Now, the incarnation is the historic Christian doctrine that Jesus of Nazareth is the eternal second person of the Trinity. That he has, in time taken upon himself a complete human nature by being born of the Virgin Mary by the power of the Holy Spirit. The doctrine of the incarnation teaches that through the work of the Holy Spirit, God the Son has become fully human in order to die for the sins of humanity and defeat death by the power of his resurrection. Although the New Testament documents uniformly affirm that Jesus is God in the flesh, Certain books of the Bible emphasize this doctrine more than others. Matthew, Romans, Galatians, Colossians come to mind. But as this quote from Jack Kilcrease says, the New Testament uniformly affirms that Jesus Christ is fully God and fully man. You will not find any gray area in the New Testament to lead you to believe that Jesus was anything other than fully God and fully man. But don't think that the idea of God in the flesh is a New Testament idea only. The Old Testament doesn't say directly that the Messiah would be God in the flesh, but there are passages that clearly hint at this fact, and they were mainly understood only after Jesus came and fulfilled all the prophecies about the Messiah, while also clearly claiming to be God. 
Jesus said in no uncertain terms that he was God and then fulfilled all of the prophecies about the Messiah, except for the ones that have yet to be fulfilled, but there are far more checked off in the book than waiting to be proven. So John 1, which the Sloan family read earlier uh, in the service, clearly states that the word was made flesh and had been God from the beginning, which obviously predates even the First Testament. If you get a chronological Bible and you open it to page one, you're not going to find in the beginning God created. You're going to find in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God and the Word was God. Because Jesus Christ has always been God. He was not made. He was not created. God did not get himself a wife and pop out a twerp. That ain't how it happened. He has always been God. And the book of Colossians and elsewhere tells us that everything that was made was made by him. Therefore, in the beginning was the word, is earlier in chronological history than in the beginning God created. Also, though, there are verses such as Isaiah 7, 14. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel, which is literally God with us. That's fairly clear, is it not? If you have a child and you name him, God's here. You think really, really highly of your kid, and you're probably wrong. Unless your name is Mary, and you were visited by an angel, and you're 2,000 and some odd years old. And then nobody here qualifies. Isaiah 9, 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Well, the Messiah is not going to be God. Really? Isaiah 9, 6 says really clearly that that's the deal. And as many of you know, Jesus' favorite name for himself while on earth, what did he call himself more than he called anything else? He rarely said, I'm the Messiah. He rarely used uh, any of the other terms. He called himself the Son of Man, which is kind of strange because it's an obscure reference. You have to know kind of some of the inner workings of the First Testament to find Son of Man, but we do. It is, it is not prevalent in the Old Testament, but it does come out of Daniel chapter 7, particularly verses 13 and 14. <coughs> Excuse me. Daniel 7, 13 and 14 says, I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. He came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. Then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people's nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom is the one which shall not be destroyed. Then just a few verses later, Daniel, still referring to the Son of Man, writes, Then the kingdom and the dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under the whole heaven shall be given to the people, the saints of the Most High. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey him. Now, we once had a a pastor here. I think many of you will remember Pastor Andy. All means all, and that's all all means. All dominions shall serve and obey him. Him. Is God a dominion? Does he have dominion? Is he sovereign? Well, absolutely. Well, then he either is the one that others are serving or he must be serving this one. And we know God does not serve any but himself. And therefore, this is clearly, the Son of Man is clearly a reference to the the Messiah as God. These descriptions of glory and an eternal kingdom and equality with the Ancient of Days applies not only to God, but to the reference of the Son of Man, and that that denotes humanity of the individual being discussed. And this is why I think Jesus chose to use this title to reference himself more than any other. Because if you knew where he got the term Son of Man, you knew he was saying, I am God Almighty. And I am a human being. He was and remains both. 
So we know incarnation is the theological term for God becoming flesh, but there's another important aspect of this idea, and it's the heart and soul of Christmas. Because incarnation is the act by which God the Son added humanity to his eternal nature. Jesus was always God. John 1 is very, very clear. Jesus was always God. Jesus became a man. John 1.14 is extremely clear on that. Jesus is still fully God and fully man. David Mathis puts it this way. His humanity is in a costume. The eternal divine son didn't simply make a cameo in the created world. He forever joined our humanity to his divinity. For all eternity, he will be fully God and fully man. See, we, 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 we think... If we're not careful, we will fall into the heretical thought that Jesus didn't exist before he was born or conceived in Mary. But the Bible is very clear. He has always been God. He was not created by God. He is not God's son in that sense. He is not a created being. He's not brothers with Lucifer or any of the other things that non-biblical ideas have come out. Jesus has always been God. He added humanity to his eternal existence. And then we can fall into the trap of thinking, well, when he went back to heaven, though, he's not God anymore, right? I mean, excuse me, he's not human anymore. He went up there and he's something different. He's back to just being God. But that is contrary to scriptures. He continues to be fully God and fully human. We'll get back to this. In Acts chapter 1, just as proof, though, where the disciples who saw Jesus go to heaven in a human body are told by the angel, he will return in the same way. In the same way is a phrase in Greek that denotes the exact same in every way. The same manner, mode, style, deportment, character. When he comes back, it will be a fully glorified, fully human, and fully God, Jesus Christ, coming back. He will come back in the flesh which tells us he's still in the flesh today. Now, nobody that I know of here is going to say this out loud, and probably nobody actually thinks these words, but as we really let our theology play out in our lives, far too many people think that Jesus was only partly man. We say, well, sure, he was really human, but he was also God, so it's not like he was really human, right? He was also God, let me assure you, Jesus is in fact more human than we are because he is everything humanity was designed and created to be. I stand today about 30 inches off the floor that you are on and so I am elevated above you only for visuality. I am a sinner saved by grace. I'm not above you in any way other than the fact that I'm standing on a platform. But if I were to step off the edge here and fall, would I be then as high as I am now? Well, the answer is clearly no. Therefore, fallen humanity is below where we ought to be had we not fallen. Sin has brought us low. Jesus Christ has defeated sin he never experienced his own sin, but he took our sin upon himself. And now in heaven, in eternity, he is everything mankind was meant to be. We are a shadow of what we were before sin entered the world. And he is everything that we will someday be when we're made like him, unfallen, untainted by sin, and uncursed, all because of his sacrifice. And so, Emmanuel means God with us. <clears throat> and he was with us in the flesh and in our world while Jesus Christ walked the earth. He came as a child to a humble family, betrothed but not married, born to a virgin, far from home. He was visited by shepherds and later wise men. He was blessed by Simeon and Anna when he was circumcised in the temple on the eighth day. He fled as a child to Egypt until God called Joseph to return to Nazareth, where Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and favor with God and man. This child, Jesus, the baby in the manger, is the reason for the season, as the saying goes, and he is the reason for our hope. 
not because he came as a baby and not because he stayed as a baby, but because he lived a life, a full life. His life full of joy and sorrow and plenty and want and feasts and hunger and temptations and defeats and friends and betrayals and worshipers and enemies, unbelieving, dysfunctional family members and the joy of watching at least some of his siblings come to faith. He experienced all of that. He was in every sense of the word with us because he was and is with us in our temptations and in our weakness. For many of us, we read these words, we think of Hebrews 4, though maybe fewer of us could have named the reference exactly. But the verses I'm about to read, you go, that's what I was thinking of. Some of you know these words, others this will be new. But it comes out of Hebrews chapter 4, verses 4 through 16. Seeing then that we have a great high priest. Why do we spend all that time studying the high priest's clothing? So we understand what it means to be the great high priest. We have a great high priest who passed through the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Now, I actually really like the phrasing of the New Living Translation, which renders verse 15 this way. This high priest of ours understands our weaknesses, for he faced all the same testings we do, yet he did not sin. Now, do you want a mouthful mouthful of wonderful news in ye old English? Don't answer that because you're getting it either way, and if you tell me no, then I feel guilty for sharing it, but we're going into. <clears throat> a man named James Usher, he was the Archbishop of Armagh in the late 1600s, early 1700s, wrote this passage, wrote of this passage in Hebrews 4, betwixt the having of such and the not having of such, an intercessor. Between the having of such and the not having of such, an intercessor. Between the, betwixt the height of him in regard of the one and the lowliness in regard of his other nature standeth the comfort of the poor sinner. I had to chew on that for a bit because I knew there was a nugget in there. Usher is saying that somewhere between the joy of having a righteous and great high priest and the horror of acknowledging our sinfulness that leads us to realize how badly we need a high priest, between the joy of having a high priest who stands before us and the fact that our sin is the reason we need him, between the unbelievable majesty of Jesus' divine nature and the humility of his earthly human suffering and temptation, that's where we find our greatest comfort. If God is infinitely qualified to be our high priest, for he is great and majestic and wonderful, if Jesus is infinitely that direction, and our sin is infinitely that direction, and if the majesty and glory and greatness of God is infinitely high, and yet Jesus lowered himself to the very depths of the earth, then where those infinite lines cross, right there, that's where we find our comfort. Because he who is infinitely great is infinitely merciful. And he who has infinitely paid for our sin will count it no more. In other words, though, let me just use J.I. Packer, I guess. He says this, the the, the perfection and indeed the very possibility of the high priesthood that he describes Christ as fulfilling depends on the conjunction of an endless, unfailing divine life with a full human experience of temptation, pressure, and pain. Where God met man, fully God, fully man, fully high priest and took our sins fully upon him, where those points meet. In other words, If Jesus was not completely obedient and completely tempted, he is completely unqualified to serve as our great high priest. But you might say, well, you know what? Hey, hold on there. That's all fine, Dandy. That's great. It works in your theological circles. But you're forgetting something. Jesus had that whole God nature thing going on. He was tempted, 
but he was always able to say no to the temptation. I can't do that. Can I get an amen? Don't raise your hand. I'll give you an amen from my heart, but then the word of God slaps me back into my place. But if you turn to 1 Corinthians 10, 13, it says, no temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Don't misunderstand. I'm not saying we can be sinless and perfect in this life. That is the standard, but it is not the expectation. What I am saying is that we can resist every temptation, every temptation, or else God is a liar. We, we won't because we're liars. We won't resist every temptation because we're sinful and we live in a fallen world. But we cannot then stand before God and say, I didn't have a choice. Or the devil made me do it. <clears throat> we have a choice. And the devil can tempt us. But he cannot cause us to sin because in every temptation, God will provide a way of escape so that we are able to stand up under it. Secondly, while Jesus did have dual natures, divine and human, we who have come to him in repentance and belief have been reborn, John 3.3. 3. And we therefore have a new nature, one that is being made like Christ. Not that we'll ever be God, don't misunderstand. We will never be God, but we will someday be fit for his presence. So while we don't have two natures like he did, we do have a new nature. And our new nature is like his. And we also have the Holy Spirit who leads us into Christ-likeness. And all of this flows out of the fact that Jesus was with us in our world, and he was and he is with us in our temptations. Perhaps Boyce said it best. He certainly says it better than I do because he writes, The incarnation coming in the midst of a history of human sin indicates that God has not abandoned us but loves us and values us even in our fallen state. The incarnation does two further things. It shows us that God is able to understand us and sympathize with us, with us, which is an invitation to come to him in prayer. Also, the incarnation gives an example of how a person ought to live in this world. Peter even refers to the crucifixion in such terms. Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. You see, Jesus endured every temptation. And he did so without sin. But he suffered because of it. And it is in his suffering and in his obedience that we are called. Thirdly, and finally, at least as far as this point is concerned, Jesus was and is with us in our weaknesses. You know, you know, um, uh, Away in a Manger. You familiar with that song? If you've been around here, you know my rant. I will not rant today, I promise. But we don't sing the second verse of that because I cannot figure out a way to write it so it's not heresy. And right now you're going, I wish I had a hymnal. The cattle are lowing, the poor baby wakes. But little Lord Jesus, no crying he makes because he's just God. He's not really a, a baby. He's just God because a perfect baby would not cry if some big old bovine mooed in their face, Right? wrong. When we sing that song, we take away the humanity of Christ. Some big old cow bellers in the face of the Messiah as a baby. He's going to wake up. He is going to cry. And Joseph is going to want to have T-bone that night. Because that cow woke my kid up. Jesus was weak with us. As a baby, he cried. He did not come out of the womb able to speak or able to turn water into milk. Didn't happen. He cried and Mary woke up in the middle of the night. Want to hear something that made my junior high kids laugh? And you can chuckle too, it's fine. But when I was a youth pastor, I used to point out that Mary and Joseph had to change Jesus' diapers because Jesus, the baby, pooped. Why do, I, why do I even say it? Because it's important for us to understand the humanity of our Savior, the weakness that comes with being in the flesh. We know Jesus grew weary and tired. John 4, 6 tells us that. 
That's how he had the conversation with the woman at the well, because he just said, guys, I'm, I'm pooped. Understand that when a rabbi of first century uh, Israel would be leading his disciples, he was walking backwards the whole day as they walked in front of him. So for every step that they took walking along the road, Jesus was walking backwards. By the time they got to the well, Jesus goes, dudes, I am worn out. I'm going to plop right down here, and you guys go into town and find some food. And he had that conversation with the Samaritan woman. We know that he was hungry. Matthew 4, 2, Matthew 21, 18. Even after he was raised from the dead, he ate. Luke 24, 42. We know that Jesus wept, John eleven thirty five. 35. We know Jesus was chastised and forced to submit to authorities that did not know everything he knew, and that must have disheartened him a little bit. Because he had to balance the fact that he was about his father's business there in the temple of Jerusalem when he was 12, but his parents said, son, you need to come home with us. And the Bible says that he submitted to them, and he went home because it is right to submit to those, even his parents, his earthly parents, did not know what he knew. Jesus was absolutely drained in the Garden of Gethsemane, emotionally, physically, spiritually, by the prospect of facing the cross. The very reason he came to earth as a baby and lived the life of humility that he lived, when the time came to face it, he was obliterated emotionally and physically and spiritually, sweating drops of blood and praying fervently. We can certainly guess with sanctified intuition that Jesus was sick. At some point, he had the sniffles. He was injured. He probably pounded his thumb with one of Joseph's hammers a time or two. He got indigestion, pink eye, athlete's foot. He probably just didn't feel like doing ministry some days. We can guess these things with certainty because these are the things that we deal with. And the Bible tells us he was tempted in every way as we are. You ever been tempted to just stay in bed when you know you ought to go to church? Sure. You ever give in to that temptation? No, pastor, no. Well, I don't know if I believe that. Why do I mention this? Well, because it's really hard to talk to people born rich about budgets or about being hungry without any food in the house. They just don't Understand, it's hard to believe that someone who has never faced cancer can really empathize with you when you get your diagnosis. It's tough to open up to people who have their masks on so securely that you don't see any cracks in their facade when your world is falling apart. But Jesus is none of those things because he is all of those things. And I'm not claiming Jesus had cancer, but that he experienced firsthand every temptation and all the weaknesses that threatened to drag us down into the pit. He's actually been in the pit, the deepest pit, the tomb of death, and he came through it. And because he has been through every temptation and weakness, yet he stood firm in his unfailing obedience, he alone is qualified to serve as a great high priest. I refer you, of course, to Hebrews 4, 14 through 16 that we read a minute ago, but also Hebrews 2, 17 and 18. Therefore, in all things he had to be made like his brethren, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God, to make propitiation, now there's a word to study, to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to aid those who are tempted. You tempted to give up? What did Jesus say when he was tempted to give up? If it is possible, I want out of this, let this cup pass from me. But... Not my will, but yours be done. And then what did he do? He went and he woke his believing friends and said, pray with me. They weren't faithful. But Jesus continued to come back and to say, I'm not wearing a mask, guys. The next 24 hours of my life, are worse than anything that has ever existed in the history of anything. And I need you to rouse yourselves and to love me and pray with me. It is his example we follow, not theirs. And it is okay, Christians, to come to others and say, rise from your slumber and pray with me. 
because my world is falling apart. My health is, is trash. My finances are, are abysmal. My hope is evaporating. And I want this cup to pass from me, but I've got to do his will. And in order to do that, I need you to come along beside me. This, Christians, is the example that he set for us. And he himself has suffered being tempted. He's able to aid those who are being tempted. Finally, he was with us in our place. And maybe in, in, in my attempt at uniformity, I made this statement more confusing than it ought to be. He was with us in our world. We understand that. He was with us in our temptations and our weaknesses. We understand that. He was with us in our place. But what I mean by that is that Jesus not only stood with us in our world, he stands with us in our temptation and weakness, but he also stands in our place having taken the cross we deserve upon himself. But don't take it from me. Take it from the word of God, which repeatedly teaches that Jesus Christ came in our place. 2 Corinthians 8, 9, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you, through his poverty, might become rich. 2 Corinthians 5, 21, For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Romans 5, 18, Therefore, as through one man's offense, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation, even so, through one man's righteous act, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. Isaiah 53, 4 through 6, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. And all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Please understand, Christians, and even more so any non-believers who are out there, Jesus Christ came in our place. James Boyce, in, in the quote I used at the very beginning of the message, said very clearly, the whole reason for the incarnation, the entire reason God became man was atonement. Jesus literally lived so that he could die. He was then raised just to prove that he didn't have to die, thereby proving to us that our death has been paid for by the only one who truly was undeserving of death. And just about every theologian has set out to demonstrate how the incarnation, how God becoming man, and atonement, God reconciling himself and mankind, how they're related. We're trying to tie Christmas and Easter, it's not difficult. I don't mean trying like, oh, it's so hard. It's, it's very simple. But since Christ came and lived and died and was raised again, we have sought to better and more fully understand the tie between Christmas and Easter. And I'm convinced if you did it better than Anselm of Canterbury in the 11th century and John Calvin of Geneva in the 16th century, they each argued, and Calvin really built on Anselm's work. By the way, every time I quote John Calvin, I get an email or a phone call or text message or conversation. Oh, you, you must be one of those reformed guys. You're Calvinist. I'm not teaching Calvinism here. I'm saying that you can think what you want of Calvin, but he got this right. Okay? And here it is. They each argued this. Calvin built on Anselm's work. So putting it all together, he says this. Salvation had to be achieved by God because no one else could achieve it. Any of you capable of saving yourselves? Go ahead and raise your hand if you are capable of saving yourself. Okay? So somebody had to save you. And it wasn't going to be you. It ain't going to be me. It had to be God. So if we are to be saved, only God who has both the will and the power to save can save us. So the choice that God had was either I step in and save these people or they don't get saved. But I want them saved. I want to be with my people. I want to enjoy my creation forever. So I will step in. But here's the other thing. And people are going to say, Calvin wrote this? Yeah, he did. Salvation must also be achieved by humanity. Here's what I mean, or what they mean, Anselm and, and Calvin and others. Hundreds of others have made this point. Humanity, we are the ones who've wronged God. 
And therefore, we must make the wrong right. Now, maybe, and I, I guess Pastor Chad aired, aired it out last week, he and Cherie have occasionally had an argument. Your other pastor and his wife have occasionally had arguments. Nobody else in the entire congregation has ever dealt with this. You're just going to have to pretend that you understand what we're dealing with here, where a married couple sometimes has a disagreement. And if you are the one who is clearly in the wrong, if you were the stupid one, and I usually am, if you were the stupid one who did the dumb thing that caused the rift in your marriage, it is your job to go fix it. You must start the reconciliation process with an admission of guilt and a willingness to be reconciled. We who are human have wronged God. It's up to us to make the wrong right because God didn't do anything wrong. So therefore, if you take these three in a logical progression, they lead to a therefore statement. Salvation had to be achieved by God because no one else could do it. If we're to be saved, only God can. But salvation must also be achieved by humanity because we're the ones who sinned. Therefore, salvation can be achieved only by one who is both God and human. And that can only mean Jesus Christ. There is no other way to save humanity except for that a human being pays the penalty. That's why Jesus couldn't, couldn't just appear as a 30-year-old man suddenly <laughs> transported down from USS Emmanuel, right? Beam me back up, Scotty. No, Jesus couldn't just appear. He had to come as a child, live a life because he had to be fully human. Now, let's get back to more Christmassy verse. Matthew 1.21, And she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Do you know what Jesus means? Jesus is the Greek pronunciation of the Hebrew name Yeshua. And we know Yeshua as the fifth book of the Bible. Joshua. We're going to talk about how Joshua fits into the eternal plan of God when we get to uh, that in our study of Exodus, which we will return to. But Yeshua, we tend to Englishize into Joshua, but regardless of the pronunciation, the Hebrew word Yeshua means Jehovah saves. Mary and Joseph were to call their son Jesus because he was the one coming to save us from our sins. That's the reason he came, to die. And in his dying, to bring life to all who believe in his name, John 1. Are you starting to see how kicking off Christmas season with communion is wholly appropriate? I'm actually going to quote Boyce again. I did a lot of reading, but I just kept coming back to him. He said, If the death of Christ on the cross is the true meaning of the incarnation, then there is no gospel without the cross. Christmas by itself is no gospel. The life of Christ is no gospel. Even the resurrection, important as it is in the total scheme of things, is no gospel by itself. For the good news is not just that God became human, nor that God has spoken to reveal a proper way of life to us, or even that death, the great enemy, is conquered. Rather, the good news is that sin has been dealt with, of which resurrection is a proof. And so I want to bring this message to a close, but in so doing, I want to prepare us for the celebration of the Lord's Supper. In 1 Corinthians eleven twenty eight, 28, explicitly tells us to examine ourselves to see what we have sought to hide from God, what we refuse to surrender to Him, and what is hindering us from experiencing the full joy of our salvation. Jesus Himself explained the symbolism of communion when He instituted it the night before He was killed on the cross. He told us that the bread represents his body, a wholly appropriate thing upon which we ought to pause and meditate while we're celebrating the incarnation. He took upon himself a body. We have Christmas because he gave himself a body and that body was broken for us. The cup represents his blood, the necessary sacrifice to pay for the sins of those who could not ever hope to pay for them ourselves. And as I mentioned, I was deeply touched by Dr. Boyce's writings on this subject, so I will share one more nugget of his wisdom, and then we'll prepare our hearts for the table. 
He offered himself as a sacrifice in our stead, bearing our sin in his own body on the tree. He suffered not only awful physical anguish, but also the unthinkable spiritual horror of becoming identified with the sin to which he was infinitely opposed. Infinitely opposed. Infinitely opposed to sin. This, this adjective, this ten-letter qualifier, that four-syllable word of truth stabbed me right through the heart. And perhaps it did more to begin the preparation of my heart than anything else I came across this week. Infinitely. Jesus Christ as God is infinitely opposed to sin. Let me say that again, and I'm going to move it up on the screen to drive home my point. Jesus Christ was infinitely opposed to sin. That's why he came as a baby to live as a man, to die as a sacrifice, to be resurrected as a promise, because he is infinitely opposed to sin. And yet, Jesus Christ, as man, became sin that we might become his righteousness. How deep the love of God for us. How magnificent his grace. How dare I be anything less than infinitely opposed to my sin? And I pray we might, before we come to the table, be brought closer to the place where we truly are like Christ in our hatred of sin, and yet we fully embrace him as the one who took our sin upon himself. His body broken, his blood spilt, his people saved, and all at his expense. The one who is infinitely opposed to sin became sin because he is infinitely in love with his people. How can we respond with anything less than intense hatred of that which he hates? I'm going to invite the worship team to come up and prepare themselves for the next song. And even as we, we prepare ourselves for what comes after, the gathering of God's family around his table. And we don't have a table down here tonight or this morning. I thought about bringing the communion table down but I, I want us to take the time during this song to remember and proclaim the death of his son. He is the host of the meal. And we don't deserve this honor. But for those who have been reborn into Christ, we cannot be disqualified from it because the penalty has been paid, our slate wiped clean, the price of admission long ago covered on our behalf. We here at Creekside practice what is called open communion where we encourage every believer to participate, whether you're a member or not. If you're a member of the body of Christ, you're welcome to partake of the body and blood of Christ. We also greatly discourage non-believers from participating, not only because it can't have any true meaning for you, but because it's an invitation to judgment and we care about you too deeply <clears throat> to have you do that. So instead of inviting you as a non-believer to participate in communion, could I, could I invite you to salvation? Can I invite you to trust in the one who became human in order to rectify what we could not? To solve a problem only God could solve for the people who needed to solve it. Come to Christ. And we'll be delighted to help you understand what that means and how to do so. For now, I want to close in prayer. And then we're going to sing a song that we introduced at the Thanksgiving Eve service. We encourage you then not to sing along. This time you're, you're welcome to, but I really almost prefer you, you didn't. But instead, let the words wash over you. And prepare your hearts to come to the table where our Savior waits to celebrate with you. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, in fairness, we ought to perish. You didn't have to save us, but you chose to. It was because it was your will to save us. We know that it would not have been right for you to leave us without hope. 
because it was your desire, your will to rescue us. The restoration of creation to creator had to be done, but it could not be done by the created. So the one by whom everything that was made was made stepped in and took humanity into your perfect being so that those who should pay and could not might be credited with full payment without, in fact, any payment at all. Salvation is a free gift given to all who believe. Those who believe must be infinitely opposed to sin, for we know the price paid to set us free from it. Help us, Lord, to hate our sin. Help us to love our Savior enough to hate our sin. Prepare us now to come to the table, not literally, for we will remain in our seats, and there's no table up here anyway. But we come figuratively, for we do not occupy a temple made by hands, but we acknowledge that we are in the presence of the one who never leaves us or lets us go. We come to the table because the host has paid the price of admission, and the feast is in his honor and for our sustenance. Prepare us to experience your presence in these reminders of your sacrifice. It's in your name that we pray this. Amen.